Circuit Python day. We code and play the open source way. Circuit Python day. We code and play the open source way. We code and play. Hello and happy Circuit Python day. I'm maker Melissa and sponsored by Adafruit to work on electronics projects, including the online Circuit Python code editor, which I will be discussing today. I will be going over some of the challenges I have faced while working on the site from the beginning. Don't forget to use discount code CPD16 to get 16% off your order all day today. The code editor originally started out as a Bluetooth only tool almost three years ago and was written originally using the Snowpack package by Scott Shawcroft, also known as Tanute. It had a very basic interface, but it worked very well. I took over the project and worked on improving the user interface using a design similar to one that I had used on a few different tools that I had previously worked on. I also made sure that it was scaling properly to work with mobile devices around this time, which led me to the first challenge. The challenge was adapting the interface so that it worked on desktop computers, but also scaled down to still be usable on mobile devices we decided to send the design to Adafruit's UI designers to come up with a concept. I was able to take the design concept and make the necessary changes to the application. After the new design was interactive, one of the internal designers was able to give some suggestions to improve the design. I updated the layout to match the new design suggestions, and for the most part, the design hasn't varied much since. When Bluetooth workflow was first introduced, the file operations needed to be done via special calls to the board. The idea behind this workflow was that somebody could take a board, hook it up in whatever way they like, and be able to edit the code remotely. The original library, called BLE File Transfer JS, was also written by Scott. This included basic operations such as reading and writing files. The library used promises and event listeners to handle many of the file operations. However, new functionality was added to CircuitPython to allow for operations such as deleting, moving, listing, and renaming files. I extended the library to work with these new operations. However, because I had only done a little work with promises, I needed to learn much more about the concept. A promise in JavaScript is kind of like a handle to an asynchronous operation so that you can keep track of it. A promise is resolved if the operation completes successfully and it is rejected if something goes wrong. When you create the promise, you basically tell it what to do next in either circumstance. With the library complete, I needed a simple file dialog. I went through many pre-made ones, but finding one where you could have it make custom calls to a custom library proved to be challenging, so I decided to create my own dialog. I went with a very simple design that was able to work with a single file at a time and included a toolbar with buttons that would enable or disable depending on what was selected. After testing and testing and fixing any bugs I found, I added it to the editor and have really had very little issue with the dialog. Recently I have extended the dialog to work with multiple files and this includes operations such as moving, deleting, uploading, and downloading the files. After the editor had been out a while, Web Workflow was developed. Web Workflow took Bluetooth code editing to the next level and worked over Wi-Fi. Rather than creating a new editor for it, we decided to modify the current editor. I made some big design changes at this point to allow it to accommodate multiple workflows. The Bluetooth only editor required a connection to be established prior to editing and if you disconnected you would need to reconnect before being able to continue working on your file. I decided it made sense to allow editing files right away and to have the editor request to make a connection if you wanted to do anything that required you to do any file operations, such as saving or opening a file. This also opened the door up to allow for USB workflow, 
which I knew at this point was a likely future workflow to add as it was working with other editors. One of the big challenges to getting web workflow working was the fact that it only functioned over HTTP and the website only functioned over HTTPS. I think one of the main reasons that web workflow doesn't support HTTPS is because the certificates that it requires would probably take up too much room on the device. However, I'm still hoping that HTTPS support is eventually added as devices come with more and more storage. To get around the device issue, I ended up creating a proxy script that lives on the code editor site, as well as a small bootstrap script that is stored on the device and runs the proxy script. When the device loads the proxy script, it pulls down all of the code and images into the browser via HTTPS and runs the code as if it were stored on the device. To the user, this is seamless, but it makes it much easier to develop the site as well as taking up very little room on the device. Web Workflow also implements MDNS for device discovery. This allows a board to see any other devices on your local network. This is handled in the background by CircuitPython, but allowing switching between devices was a bit of a challenge. Part of the problem was that each device needed to be visited at a different URL, which caused the page to reload and the work was lost. The solution was to take the code that had been typed out and pass it in as a variable as part of the URL. Then at the new location, decode the information, place it in the document, and remove it from the URL. This took a little bit of experimenting, but has been working relatively well for the past while. With Web Workflow added, it seemed appropriate that we should add binary uploads and downloads, such as images and sounds, so that a person did not need to rely on the CircuitPy drive and could do all of their work within the editor itself. Uploading and downloading single files was fairly straightforward because I was able to reference the code from the built-in editor. Uploading folders wasn't too bad because the browser still feeds them back one at a time. However, for downloading entire folders, I decided to use JSZip to add all the files inside the folder into a zip file so that the user could download everything in one operation. A couple of years back, Snowpack was no longer being developed, so with the help of a community member, we were able to make the jump over to Veet. They did a great job and even added a cool feature so that you could see the text you were editing and the serial terminal at the same time. The challenging part about this was that a lot of testing was needed to be done and even after I thought everything was working fine, I ended up needing to go back and fix a few bugs after the fact. After Web Workflow had been working for a while, I decided to add USB Workflow. To do this, I knew I needed to interface with the REPL, so I decided to write a library to handle this for me. At the time, I was only familiar with interacting in normal mode, so I wrote the library to interact with it in this way. Surprisingly, it was actually working quite well in this manner, and until recently, we had it running like this. In order to write files to a board, I utilized a Chrome feature called File System API. This worked by requesting for the user to grant permission to write files to a location on the hard drive. However, this was only available on boards that had a CircuitPy drive and relied on the user to select the correct location. The reason I needed to add REPL interaction was because we needed to verify that the board ID that we were accessing via the serial terminal was the same board that we were also accessing through the file system API. Recently, we decided that we wanted to extend the USB workflow to work on boards that had no CircuitPy drive. In order to do this, we needed to go through the REPL and use CircuitPython's file functions. In theory, this would also allow us to work with MicroPython boards. Around the same time, I learned about raw mode and raw paste mode. After reading through the documentation, it sounded like raw paste mode was the way to go, so I worked on implementing it. 
one of the issues that I ran into with raw paste mode was that it would echo back the output. To get around this, I needed to capture the output and return only half of it. This worked reasonably well, but it was still behaving a bit glitchy. After talking with Dan Halbert, I realized raw mode was the way that I needed to go. I went back to the drawing board and rewrote the library with a focus on simplifying how it worked and only using raw mode. After some trial and error and fixing a few bugs, I had it working reasonably reliably. One of the important approaches that I needed to take was that I had to implement better mode awareness and that seemed to make a huge difference. One challenging aspect of working with files over the REPL is that if a CircuitPy drive is loaded, then the file system is mounted as read-only. So rather than try and get the user to unmount the drive or put it in a writable state, we decided to automatically detect if the file system is read-only through a system call. If it is read-only, we generally assume that there is a CircuitPy drive mounted and go through the file system API still. Otherwise, we can run all the file operations through the REPL. While saving and loading text files over the REPL is fairly straightforward because they are just text, this was not the case with binary files. To handle binary files, what I ended up doing for uploading was taking the file, encoding it as Base64 through JavaScript, and then decoding it through the Python file operations in the REPL. Downloading files was just the reverse of that. While many online editors support MicroPython at first and add CircuitPython support later on, we went the reverse route. It actually ended up being fairly trivial to support it. For the most part, it can be assumed that the file system is not read-only because MicroPython does not mount a CircuitPy drive. So when we go to make a call to check if the file system is read-only, it will trigger an import error out because the storage module is not part of MicroPython. We can then assume that the file system is not read-only. Another challenge that I had to overcome with this was I wanted to be able to get to the raw mode, no matter what mode that we're currently in, and so I needed to issue a series of commands in order to get it to the normal mode. One way that I did this was I took all the different modes and I mapped out on a document in order to figure out what needed to happen to get from each mode to another mode. And that seemed to help a lot. Since the code editor had been originally written, testing has been done on my system locally, and then the code was uploaded to GitHub, where it was published through GitHub Pages. In order to test changes, the reviewer had to download the code to their computer and test it locally. This worked reasonably well for a while, but the code editor has been growing in popularity. We recently ran into an issue where it appeared to work fine locally, but once it was published, it worked differently. We decided to set up a beta site. After doing a bunch of research, it didn't appear there was a way to have GitHub Actions publish a second site from another branch in the same repository. And switching between different repositories was gonna be a little bit of a juggling act. However, after conferring with our internal web services admins, we came up with a solution where it was published through Cloudflare. It works by taking the package.json file and installing everything. It's not exactly the same as running it through GitHub Actions, but it works better than testing it locally versus live publishing. The CircuitPython code editor is still actively being developed with new features being added. If you'd like to check it out, you can go to https colon forward slash forward slash code.circuitpython.org or if you'd like to check out the beta site with all of the latest features, you can simply go to https colon forward slash forward slash code dash beta dot circuitpython dot org. And I hope you have a happy CircuitPython day today. CircuitPython day, we code and play the open source way. 
Circuit Python day. We code and play the open source way. We code and play.